this lecture today will serve as a kind of time machine for me, as uh, Chris already mentioned, because it offers me the chance to, to look back somehow to, to in time and to summarize the last 10 years of my uh, academic life between private troubles and public issues, to use the famous words of uh, C. Wright Mills. Because food banks are a public issue in Germany, I think here in the UK as well, and for many people they are a synonym as well for private troubles. So it's something in between and it's the field for sociology. And um, you invited me as a sociologist today who, who conducted some research about food banks in Germany. But I think what is more important is my um, my public sociology as part of this research. You will see later. Um, at the moment, the focus of my research is not, is not food bank research because the focus shifted since 2013 to uh, different uh, issues like the digital transformation of society, uh, sustainability, public uh, and transformative science and so on. And there are, is a reason for it. And I will tell you the reason at the end of my lecture. Um, the main focus is not food banks, but the main focus at the moment is um, transformative science. And I'm doing some research about the question how sociologists can write sociologically informed narrative nonfiction for wider publics. In other words, I explored boundaries between literature and science at the moment. And you, you may wonder about this focus, but on the other hand, this, this research question emerged directly from my food bank research, because I, from the beginning I was interested in getting in contact with, uh, with publics and not only with uh, academic colleagues and so on. So anyway, there is still a strong um, interest in research about poverty, of course as you will notice in this lecture. And I'm still interested in questions like social inequality, discrimination, digital discrimination as well, related issues. And hopefully this gives us the chance to discuss uh, after this, um, this lecture. OK, this, this lecture today has a kind of double focus. I will call it a double focus. I will summarize my findings about food banks. Uh, of course, I will introduce a, a kind of model about uh, food banks. By the way, food banks are called Tafeln uh, in German, uh, in Germany. And the word Tafel, Tafel in German language means a table loaded with precious food in the context of festivity. So it's something very, very positive. And this connotation is very crucial in order to understand the, the meaning and the culture of food banks in times of austerity. Uh, you call it food bank. This is a slightly different connotation than table or tafel. So um, today I want to introduce my research findings against the background of public sociology, using some selected uh, examples and making some statements about my way of public sociology um, without explaining in detail the concept or the paradigm of public sociology, like it is being discussed since 2004 by Michael Borrowway and, and, and others and so on. This would be a complete uh, different lecture. And there are three reasons, at least, for this double focus. On the one hand, food bank research, and on the other hand, public sociology. When I published my first book about German Tafeln, I framed this research uh, using the term public sociology for the first time without having any plan, any special thing in mind, what, what's the meaning about public sociology, just because public sociology somehow resonated uh, with me. I liked the term. So uh, from the beginning, uh, I could not separate research and social activism. I always wanted to open a debate or uh, contribute to a public debate, and therefore the term public sociology resonated somehow with me. But I had no theory in mind or something like this. Later, some years later, I learned to call this organic public sociology, a sociology that engages with the public and so on. And I'm just going to give you some, some examples for this organic public sociology without explaining the whole theory and so on uh, behind it. We can probably discuss this later. 
And since 2015, I'm a research professor for transformative and public science. The reason why I call it transformative and public science is that just simply because I'm a professor at a very technical university and I avoid the term sociology because everybody feels threatened by sociolo sociologists. So transformative and public science uh, sounds smart, uh, it's not a danger, and that's the reason for it. But transformative is very important because to transform something, to change something, is the effect of a public debate, and this is my, um, my most important aim. So these are the reasons why for this double focus. And uh, now let me demonstrate uh, why, from my point of view, food bank research matches perfectly with um, public sociology. Let's enter my personal time machine. Um, once I started uh, with food bank research in the year 2006 just by chance, because one of my students mentioned food banks in a small talk, and I wondered, uh, food banks? Well, what is a food bank? Do we have really places like this in Germany? I couldn't believe. I really couldn't believe it. And then I started, to make a long story short, I started with my curiosity as a sociologist. I started to, to look around and, and I noticed that uh, there is hardly anything published in terms of sociological research about food banks in the year 2006. In the year 2008, uh, we already had 15 years of food banks in Germany. So for me, it was a kind of scandal. And my curiosity led me to uh, field work, to ethnographic uh, field work in a town, Karlsruhe, in the southwest of Germany, um, where I had a job at the university, uh, not as a professor, but um, um, as a, yeah, in the academic staff. And I tried to summarize all these findings in the first book. And I want to tell you uh, very important story about this book, which I published 2008, Fast ganz unten. In English, it's probably nearly at the bottom, something like this. So um, a very important magic moment in my life and changed everything. And uh, probably I will tell this story until I die, but it's, it's very, very important. And hopefully it encourages some of you to to think about writing and doing research for broader publics and audiences as public sociologists or public scientists or whatsoever. So I started to summarize my findings um, using the, the common academic framework and the voiceless, academic, neutral style of writing as usual. And my wife is um, usually my first and most important audience. And when I presented the first chapter, uh, of this book uh, to her, she asked a very simple question to me. She asked, don't you have something else? It sounds boring. Uh, yes, I told her, but only some memos, something I've written spontaneously after my research. Show me, she asked. Uh, and then I showed her these memos and she said, you have to write like this, exactly like this. This is what people want to read. And the reaction to, to her statement still thrills me today because it shows that science can be a prison or a bunker or whatever you want. And I answered, I can't because it's forbidden to write like this in social sciences. And nowadays, today, I would say, no, it's not forbidden, not at all. If you have in mind a concept like public sociology, if you are a public sociologist. So this is the most important lesson in my life. And um, yeah, th thanks to my wife, I uh, rewrote everything and published this book in as a kind of social reportage with a strong personal voice. And I demonstrated uh, in this book my personal search, my curiosity about food banks because I started to, to love food banks, to really be impressed by food banks. Uh, and then I entered backstage all these areas and I wrote about front end and back end and so on. And I developed a critical perspective um, step by step. So this was a very important magic moment for me. Finally, this, this first book changed a lot in Germany um, because it was the first time that someone told stories from the backstage of Tafel. And, uh, 
f was the first time a, a public debate really started about risks, uh, consequences, ambivalences of, of uh, this system, which already existed 15 years in Germany, and there was no critique at all about it. So and during this debate, this public debate, um, somehow t someone told me that fast ganz unten, this book, uh, was the end of the voicelessness. He called it the end of the voicelessness. And this was um, really for me as a public sociologist, success. The end of the voicelessness, this was my success, not in terms of academic career. Uh, to make it short, the, f the whole food bank research issue ruined my academic career. Mm -hmm. But it was the start of a career as a public sociologist, if you like. So many people in these years wanted to criticize food banks in Germany. And they had the competences, the, uh, the insights and everything, but they couldn't. Because they were employees of uh, the welfare system and so on. They weren't allowed to speak in public. And this was exactly my position as a professor for sociology and so on. It's very simple. Uh, Today, I'm convinced that public sociology goes together, matches perfectly with issues like food bank research. It's just one example. There are different examples as well. So the next years of my life were quite exciting. Uh, more and more media experiences, uh, newspaper interviews, public debates, and so on. And I, I wasn't prepared for this, because you don't learn this at the university. Not at all. So I had to learn everything on my own and make my own experiences and so on. And without having a plan, uh, I transformed myself into a public sociologist. And some days, uh, someday, probably in 2011 or 12, colleagues from Switzerland, Austria, and finally, finally Germany, invited me to conferences uh, in order to explain uh, what organic public sociology is, how it works, and so on. So this was really interesting for me. I started without a plan, and I just did it. And then I theorized everything, and I connected myself to this global debate about public uh, sociology. Um, I also stayed in the framework of classical academic science. Between 2009 and 11, I edited three volumes about food bank research in Germany, connecting probably most of the relevant researchers in this field in Germany, uh, Austria, and so on. The first book is called uh, Tafeln in Germany, Food Banks in Germany. The second, Critique of the Food Banks. And the third one, Transformation of Food Banks. And this was really a mistake, because in 2011, I thought food banks could be transformed in dialogue with uh, academic research but they can't. Anyway, um, between 2011 and 14, I led the research project Tafel Monitor. We monitored uh, somehow Tafel, and I personally interviewed 150 food bank clients, as you call them, and uh, 30 food bank volunteers in nearly all federal states of Germany. This was the, the um, basis of my research. And I published the website Tafel Forum, I think in 2010, I don't know. And the motivation of this website simply was to give the voiceless poor a voice. Uh, and Tafel Forum probably can be called a kind of counter public. Um, and it was very useful in the beginning. Um, now it isn't anymore, I would say. But at the beginning, the discussion on this uh, Tafel Forum website was very important, and it was the only source of critical research also for journalists in Germany. A lot of journalists contacted me because of this website. Um, but the most important year for my veteran performance as a food bank researcher was 2013. 2013, we celebrated somehow 20 years of Tafel in Germany, and I published a book called Schamland. Land of Shame. And in the introduction of this book, I coined the term uh, wütende Wissenschaft, in English, angry science. Mm -hmm. And it's really amazing, because wütende Wissenschaft, angry science, uh, has been quoted a lot of times. And I just wanted, in this introduction, make clear my mindset for everybody, for everyone, uh, that science is not neutral about food banks, and uh, it, science should take action. And 
Yeah, I want, just want to quote from this introduction. The heart of my public sociology is the urge to get involved in debates and voice my stance. My sociology is an angry science. It isn't neutral. It is interest-driven in the literal sense of the word. To have sympathy with others, normative, dedicated social research that is hopefully strong enough to end the prevailing silence because it listens to the language of those who are affected. To listen to the language to those who are affected means that this book was just about the perspective of the food bank clients. Because I really um, uh, was angry about the fact that in the public debate, in the media, the perspective of the volunteers was dominant. And nobody really noticed the, the counter perspective. And in this year, um, we founded um, the Aktionsbündnis 20 Jahre Tafel, a network um, as a kind of counter public as well, a part of Angry Science, a network of people and institutions criticizing food banks in Germany, for example, NGOs that fight for human rights, members of labor unions, members of the welfare services, social scientists, critical social scientists, and of course, food bank clients. This was a really complicating process, but in the end, um, we had a lot of members. And our objective, especially in the year 2013, was to change the public opinion, the public consciousness about Tafel in Germany. Uh, this is why I produced, uh, for example, three video clips together with students as a form of, we call it, visual culture jamming. And I will show you one or two of them at the end when we have still time. But we organize, and this is the most important point in my uh, career as a public sociologist, the public, um, how do you call it, a public performance or something in Berlin, right in front of the Brandenburg Gate, which is uh, in the center of Berlin. Uh, and around this performance, a three-day uh, conference workshop, alternative conference, um, I also show you in the end a video about this full with lectures, discussions, discussions, performances uh, um, of artists, and so forth. Uh, we performed in public in front of the Brandenburg Gate uh, in the center of Berlin, demonstrating what Tafel literally means. Uh, I reckon the picture speaks for itself. Uh, a table loaded with precious food um, in the context of festivity. And at the end, of this year, and this is something very important for me as well, some elements like this flyer or t-shirts um, will uh, be displayed in the House of History in the ger of the German government in Bonn and Berlin. And I guess this is a wonderful example uh, how public sociology itself can go public. Now here you see um, how people queue in front of this tafel, um, wait for uh, for their to, to be in the order to getting the, the, the food waste of these rich people and so on, and you see uh, what public sociology also means. Um, it was we ha really had a great impact in terms of media appearances and so on. I'm stop here. Um, I could talk hours about public sociology, but it's just wanted to give you uh, an impression. Um, I would like to mention that there are more examples for public sociology and organic public sociology, but probably we can discuss this uh, later. Now, I want to show you some different pictures, uh, pictures I published in the first book, Fast ganz unten, showing the real tafel uh, backstage. And you easily will notice the contrast between the tafel in front of the Brandenburg Gate and the real world. So just to give you an inside. This is some pictures from different Tafeln in Germany. We have two systems of Tafeln. We have one system is the shop system. You enter a kind of mini supermarket and you buy your things, your stuff, and you pay probably 10% of the original price. And the second one is this, um, this is the supermarket system, as you can see. People are queuing and they pay um, at the end. And the second system is um, the system where this is the supermarket system. It's like, like this system here, where you have two sides, uh, and the volunteers serve or hand out food for the food bank clients. By the way, this lady here is my mother. Uh, 
she is a food bank volunteer as well and so we have uh, very interesting discussions in our family all the time. She read all my books but she I think um, yeah read them in a different way. <laughs> anyway so um, coming to food bank to criticizing food banks uh, we should keep in mind what we're talking about it looks like this and the crucial point for me is uh, that f my research at least is less critique about food banks uh, but rather critique about a rich country that enables food bank banks as an institutionalized system so social criticism is something totally different from food bank criticism I'm not the one to criticize food banks and I'm not the one to criticize food bank volunteers but I'm a sociologist criticizing a country like Germany enabling food banks for uh, nearly 25 years. And at this point of my lecture, let me quote from a position paper published by FIAN. FIAN is an NGO in the field of food security uh, worldwide. And they discovered in the year 2012 Germany as a negative example, uh, saying the state Germany has increasingly been delegating their responsibilities of basic social services to the civil society. The human right for food is not being adequately met in Germany, so they put it on the level of human rights, but rather is increasingly in danger of being violated because the state is not fulfilling its responsibilities accordingly. So this is for me a very important uh, reference. Uh, you can, of course, um, do research at a local food bank, observe everything, but the meta level is the right for food, the human right for food. Well, my analysis um, of food banks starts or ends, better to say, with four basic narratives about the German Tafel. I'm, as a sociologist, a social scientist, obsessed by typologies because they help us to understand complex social phenomena and I'm obsessed by narratives because narratives help us to perceive our world. This is why I try to systemize the complex, very complex debate about food banks and we are not at the end of this debate in just four narratives and I want to present them to you. They are paired into two groups. Two of these narratives can be regarded as affirmative narratives which means that they endorse the existing conditions and stabilize the common sense. And the two other narratives are counter-affirmative. They do not reflect the popular opinion. They are predominantly critical. And now I'll give you an overview about all narratives and then I will go into details later. The voluntariness narrative is mainly about citizens that voluntarily solve problems in the local era and take on social responsibility from their point of view. The save our food narrative is very popular amongst the food banks uh, themselves and the main plot in terms of narrative, the main plot is about rescuing, saving food in an affluent society and redistributing this food to those who are in need. The precarization narrative focuses on the critical plot of the new management of the poor by poverty regimes. So these are three very important narratives, but I'm going to explain that this is not enough to understand food banks. I will argue that none of them serves to explain and understand food banks completely. Uh, if you want to get the big picture, the whole picture, we need a fourth narrative and this is something I call the economy of poverty narrative. Uh, because this has the potential to unmask food banks. It's a typical counter-affirmative perspective and it helps to see food banks as moral enterprises, as I call it. And they sell uh, a product in moral markets to their moral clients. And I think this is a very crucial point. Poverty and poverty relief itself becomes a fictitious commodity. So each narrative has a kind of front stage, I will argue, on which the socially desirable parts are presented and the backstage where we find ambivalences, paradoxes and so on. Now let's start with the voluntariness narrative. 
The voluntariness narrative tells a story about the increasing quantity of civil, civic engagement in Germany. We have probably you as well in the UK, regular reports about social demographic aspects of volunteers from teens to senior citizens, developments of motivation and a regular mapping of civic engagement in all federal states. So it's measured somehow. And the central plot uh, of this voluntariness narrative is about citizens that are willing and able to help uh, in a warm, uh, emphatic way instead of just living laid back without interest uh, and without observing the suffering of the others. That's an argument I always hear. You are a cold analyst and we are, we offer warm help, something like this. Uh, supposedly this is an example for the popular logic of uh, communitarianism. Empirically social scientists can demonstrate that the motivation for volunteering changed from altruism to projects of social recognition. And tafel and food banks are match perfectly into this development because people who are engaged at the tafel, they are recognized in a very, very positive way and with a very positive connotation. Against this background, food banks are a perfect match to charity in this modernized form of, of civic engagement. And here on this uh, picture you can see how it looks like when the voluntariness narrative is celebrated in the political sphere. I shot this picture in the entrance hall of the Federal Ministry of Family Affairs, Senior Citizens, Women and Youth in Berlin and on this wall you can read Germany says thanks, thanks to the volunteers and one of these volunteers volunteers is a volunteer uh, engaged at a food bank at a tafel in Germany. And um, well just to give you uh, uh, an impression. Despite its positive orientation the voluntariness narrative uh, exhibits some ambivalences also and the, ah this is another example it's, it's not from the field of food banks but a I think it's very interesting to see um, the visual forms of this um, voluntariness narrative. Um, heroes, uh, uh, people who save the world, the, the superman uh, in terms of uh, environment uh, projects and so on. And uh, we have thousands of examples like this. The backstage. The backstage of the voluntariness narrative uh, exhibits some ambivalences. For example, civil, civic engagement has turned into a factor, a measurable factor for securing one's location in society and has been made calculable in a new welfare state such as Germany. As I told you before, it's measured, the amount of civic engagement is measured every year regularly and compared with other countries. Uh, this narrative also shows that Germany constantly is shifting towards what I call a volunteer society. In a volunteer society, services are no longer paid for because volunteers offer them for free. So why should I pay for it? We will see that there is a drift uh, in the labor market from gainful employment to volunteering services. Civic engagement has uh, made an accelerated career and now seems to be a new social norm. This is also something one can, can observe, for example, Loring Sittler, one of the main advocates in Germany for civic engagement, uh, he puts it like this, the older we get, the more we are obligated to give something back to society, obligated. Um, age, Sittler says, should be considered like property. And it is linked with the normative obligation of giving something back in the form of civic engagement, whether engagement at a tafel or somewhere else. And I think it's worth to, to think about this for a moment. This argument is a very strong argument. Age is considered like property and we are obligated to give something back. It's a very strong social norm, I think. The most important argument, however, is the, from my point of view, the depolitization politicization of the social. Because in the long run the successful food banks might lead politicians to believe that they have been relieved from 
relieved of their duty to implement social reforms to expand basic security benefits. They can just lay back. And um, therefore, from my point of view, Tafeln are exemplary for how responsibility shifts from the state to private citizens, to the private sector. Tafeln claim that they are regularly criticizing poverty in Germany. Um, since I talk with um, Tafeln volunteers, this is a very central argument. The fact that we exist shows that there is poverty in Germany. But you can turn this argument also around. It might be true that we realize that there is poverty in Germany, but we also realize that there is poverty in a way that can be managed and handled by Tafeln. So there is no scandal, <coughs> there is no protest uh, uh, against poverty. And Tafeln can't really protest. Uh, and I called it hugged or soft protest, what they are doing. They can't protest against their own supporters, like the min federal ministries, a bunch of companies, as you will see later. So this is one of the main ambivalences. Um, they want to protest, they want to scandalize poverty, but in the same moment they show poverty can be managed nearly perfectly by food banks. And the more food banks we have, the less um, uh, poverty is a scandal. <coughs> well, one last argument concerning this narrative, this voluntariness narrative. Voluntary engagement depends on where people live. Uh, and I want to illustrate this with these two maps. Uh, the map on the right hand side shows how poverty spreads over Germany. And you will see, uh, you see there's a lot of poverty in the eastern federal states of Germany. And the map on the left hand side shows where the volunteers live, the food bank volunteers live. They live in the richer western federal states. So it doesn't match. We have poverty in the east and volunteers in the west. This is a map a colleague of mine, uh, um, Sedelmeier, a social geographer, um, produced and published in one of my uh, volumes about food banks. So what can we learn from this uh, map? A volunteer society that relies on this tremendous mismatch does not act in a responsible way to its own citizens. The second narrative is the Save Our Food narrative, and it's about labeling the redistribution of food as rescuing food or saving food. Uh, the original idea of Tafel, uh, first Tafel was founded in 19. Uh, 93 in Berlin was just offering emergency meals for homeless in Berlin and from this original idea the whole system emerged. This idea transformed into an ecological strategy which now is perfect in terms of the legitimization of food banks. At the first glance the plausible main statement consists of the recognition in, of an affluent consumer society and systematic overproduction of food. In such a society, food is thrown away unless it is saved or rescued, for example, by the food banks. The food saving argument is, is based on the assumption of a win-win situation. Consumers clear their bad conscience, supermarkets cut their special waste costs, Food banks collect free food and those in need receive nutrition that they would not be able to afford otherwise. At the same time, food banks rely on the fact that wasting food is a taboo uh, with religious connotations and thus morally charged. Furthermore, a great number of food bank volunteers, such as my mother, are senior citizens who suffered hunger during the Second World War, wo World War that means they have a very special protective attitude towards food and food waste. The Save Our Food narrative is not only focusing on saving food, but also on redistributing food according to ecological standards with the special trucks and so on. And therefore, it probably sh better should be called a sustainability narrative. Um, 
Indeed, there is a huge semantic and also visual field full of claims about sustainability um, in connection with food. The cover of the Tafel mag magazine Feedback, typical German word, Feedback, <laughs> um, connects Tafel with sustainability. Uh, here you can read, don't throw away. Um, the cover of the annual report the, the Federal uh, Association of Tafel of, uh, uh, publishes an uh, annual report every year, um, shows the claim sustainability focused. And this annual report also shows the lifespan of an apple uh, from the tree to the supermarket and then from the supermarket to the food bank. It's a very smart story. Um, that follows the rules of, of marketing, um, I would say. This story is not complete, this is my argument. Backstage, this narrative, the Save Our Food narrative, also contains ambivalences. The euphemistic exaltation of the food bank volunteers as food savers is problematic. Why? The food bank model has elevated debates about how to handle the waste problem. However, there have been serious doubts about the quality of studies calculating the amount of food thrown away in private homes. According to some researchers, the amount has been greatly overestimated. There's only one study in Germany conducted by the University of Hohenheim near Stuttgart about food waste. And it's not an empirical study. They just ask some experts and then from these answers, uh, they try to somehow calculate the amount of wasted food in private households. And it's the number of 82 kilos per year. So this, uh, this figure, 82 kilos, um, travels around the media and in public and so on, is never been has never been questioned. And I think the amount has been greatly overestimated. Um, and therefore, the influence to turn it around of food banks uh, on the total amount of recycled food uh, might be far less than food banks claim. It's a very strong argument, but I think the amount of wasted food is greatly overestimated. Food banks have also invoked a sustainability bias, referring routinely to the ecological sustainability um, of their actions, while at the same time neglecting the importance of social sustainability, such as self-determination of the consumer, participation in the, participation in the world of consumption, protective spaces free of paternalism, and so on. There has been a, a commission in the uh, German government in the year, I think, uh, 98, about the question, what is social sustainability? And this commission offered some answers, so we have at least a scientific definition of social responsibility. And in this report you can read that all systems like food banks and so on can't be considered as an example of social responsibility. On the other hand, the Save Our Food narrative is largely linked to the term sustainability, but ecological sustainability and not social sustainability. The main critique of this narrative is that it makes people lose sight of the food bank clients because it focuses on the ecological aspects, saving or rescuing food. Um, you could say the food is more important than the people. Food bank clients uh, do not feel like mature consumers. They describe, um, they describe an experience of poverty consumption, um, which is uh, associated with social stigma and produces a sort of broken self. In my book Shamland, I listened, listed, sorry, I listed some of the terms with which food bank clients report being labeled, such as beggar, second class citizen, a mere number, the fat. So this is the sustainability bias I'm talking of, focusing ecological aspects but um, neglecting the social sustainability aspects. We even might ask if there is a kind of poverty consumption. And now look, please, at, oh, well, this is just another 
example, a cartoon showing that the poverty reports do not show certain aspects of poverty in Germany, such as Tafel, they do not exist. This man says, uh, don't look there, uh, they are not existing at all. So it's, it's true, in the, in the main uh, federal poverty reports, uh, there is no chapter about food banks. They just do not exist. Now look at this quote, um, a statement by a former Tafel president. And he said in an interview uh, with a, a journalist, a friend of mine, Katrin Hartmann, those who are supplied with food from us are not receiving charity. They are doing something for climate and resource protection. That is an achievement of society uh, that we must recognize. This is a very serious uh, statement of the former president of the Tafel. So here you can also see the sustainability bias. The ecological aspects are more important than the social sustainability aspects. And I would argue this is really a misconception because reducing the amount of wasted food does not fight poverty at all. Getting rid of surplus food through food banks saves the food industry money. It does not, however, solve the problem of having surplus food in the first place or underlying problems of poverty. But in the media, these two, um, uh, these two pictures are, are mixed totally. The safer food narrative also is uh, commonly used in a personalized form, as you can see in this picture. It shows the king of the Tafeln in a certain town, a story about a man who saves food, which otherwise would be thrown away. And we have thousands of stories like this in the media in Germany. Um, they are not always called king of the Tafel, of course, but this is a very nice example. Uh, that means that the Save Our Food narrative, meanwhile, is part of the public and uh, media perception of Tafeln in Germany. Moreover, the alarmist emphasis on food waste merely serves to increase the legitimacy of food banks. I think this is the main, most important function for it. Um, so um, we had some years ago a cucumber scandal in Germany, another cartoon to illustrate the public perception of Tafeln. And it shows that people are queuing there for food. Bitte anstellen, please queue and they get the polluted cucumber. This is redistributed to the food bank users because they are regarded as second class uh, consumers, naturally. Meanwhile, okay, let's move on to the third one, the precarization narrative. Telling this story uh, means questioning the political framework which enabled food banks in Germany nearly 25 years ago. And I think this is also very important and crucial. The specific background here is the so-called called Hartz IV legislation. In October 2004, the German parliament approved the merger of unemployment comp compensation and social benefits. And it is called in public Hartz IV, Hartz IV. In 2005, the German government implemented a package of policies known as the Agenda 2010 which reformed the country's welfare system and labor market following paradigms previously institutionalized in the UK. On the one hand, food banks have been expanding in number um, as, well as, in the way in as well as in what they offer. That means, meanwhile, we have not only food banks, but we have children, food banks, children restaurants, cooking classes. Uh, wheels on meals for the elderly, student food banks near universities, all kind of that. Yet on the other hand, an increasing number of food banks are explaining, complaining of a shortage of, on food donations. The situation um, uh, exacerbated over the course of uh, 2015 when a rapidly, rapidly growing number of refugees started frequenting food banks too. And this is another chapter of food bank research probably to be opened by others. Uh, I won't do this probably because now we have two groups of food bank clients uh, or probably three groups and it's, it's ge really getting complicated. Simultaneously, few people are talking about those who do not use food banks. And this is something I 
continuously uh, try to, to, to explain, but nobody listens to me, <laughs> uh, we have 1.5 million people using food banks in Germany, probably. This is just an estimated number based on a study made by the food banks themselves in 2007. So I wouldn't trust this number, but let's say we have 1.5 million people. But nobody talks about the 6 to 8 million people uh, who do not use food banks in Germany, although they would pass the food bank's poverty test because they are, uh, they are um, comfortable enough because they have a, a family network, they um, do not like food banks and so on. There are reasons for these 6 to 8 million people um, not to use food banks. So there's a misconception. We're talking about the increasing number of people using food banks and we forget this great number of people who do not use food banks. The main plot of this precarization narrative uh, lies in the realization that poor people are being administered and on different levels dominated and punished probably by new control mechanisms. From a critical point of view this can be classified as a new form of social policy. The governmental treatment of the poor is a politically willed form of isolation and control through self-control. Uh, for it is within this context that citizens are expected to take on the role of the entrepreneurial self, as my colleague Ulrich Bröcklin from Freiburg puts it, and are increasingly expected to assume responsibility for their own risk management in life. This criticism is not new at all. Right after the foundation of the first Tafel in Berlin, uh, 93 by Sabine Wert, some social scientists criticized the pre-modern logic of charity by food banks. A quote from this study, forgotten study, against this backdrop, uh, they said, for a long time already it has looked like an expansion of seemingly pre-modern kinds of help in Germany. Pre-modern. So this is a quote from, a, from an article uh, which was published in 1995, two years after the first Tafel. This was th the first and only critique in Germany. And then for 10 years we had nothing. The pre-modern phase looks like this. These pictures illustrate the pre-modern look and feel of food banks. Just two examples. I have a whole collection. This painting is called The Saint of Padua and it shows the feeding of the poor in front of a church. And this picture is even uh, more uh, important. It's from the painter Jan van Bruegel the Younger, and it's called Caritas. Caritas. And it shows the feeding of the poor queuing in public. And this is how it looks like nowadays, people queuing in the street uh, for food uh, in front of a tafel in Germany. Well, uh, there are tafeln uh, which offer um, coffee and so on and people don't have to queue on the street but we still have these pictures in Germany. Not everywhere but we still have these pictures. So this leads us to the backstage of the precarization narrative. Um, losing the status as a consumer, I will argue, also affects the status as a citizen. The regime of Tafel directly leads to the individualization of blame and to shame punishment. Food banks symbolize one's own social position, fast ganz unten, uh, in a given society, and they lower the boundary of social respect respectability. Instead of a sustainable and politically forced fight against poverty, mere poverty relief has prevailed as socially willed and politically acceptable. We don't talk about fighting poverty at all. And the sh baseline which shifts is the baseline from solidarity to what I call staged solidarity. It's not solidarity at all. Before I present now the fourth, the most important narrative, um, I shortly try to explain the principles of what I call uh, 
what I call the, um, the economy of poverty. This is, by the way, uh, it's just a screenshot from the Caritas, it's uh, from the welfare, German welfare system, and uh, the headline is um, there's a pri privatization of, um, of social security. I want to explain my principles of the economy of poverty, and then I want to apply it to the use case of TAFA. Um, the main idea of the economy of poverty narrative, the fourth one, is that the food banks are synchronized with economic, political, and media interests. And this, this network of political, media, and economic interests builds a market from which many profit. Food banks act as moral entrepreneurs in this market, and the main service they offer for their moral clients is a sort of modern moral reputation in the way of symbolic capital. Economic thinking and the principle of an open market have become established in our societies, and nowadays civic engagement and economic principle merge more and more. And this is something I want to demonstrate, quoting Wendy Brown. Um, and she's talking about the stealth revolution. The stealth revolution we don't notice, but it's there step by step. More and merely saturating the meaning or content of democracy with market values, neoliberalism assaults the principles, the practices, the cultures, subjects, and institutions of democracy and transmogrifies every human domain and endeavor along with humans themselves according to a specific image of the economic. So probably this is a very crucial quote at this point, the specific image of the economic. And the consideration of an economy, economy of poverty originates from the fact that food banks predominantly find their resonance in the economic system. The idea of modeling, uh, uh, the idea of a modeling of a new econo economy follows the key question of how economic profits can be gained from poverty. And there are profits which can be gained from poverty. At first glance, food banks do not seem to fit into this category, for they do not market poverty or directly profit from poverty of food bank clients. On the contrary, they even try to relieve the poverty of their clients. In order to understand food banks as uh, moral enterprises, in order to understand food bank activities as an example of the economy of poverty, it is necessary to have a broader understanding of profit. A requirement for the formation of an economy of poverty is that the market must enter in the field of poverty. And this is where my functional chain of the economy of poverty fits into. Together, the four parts of this chain uh, uh, result in a process I call moral market. The four steps are from poverty to profit. First, shifting baselines on a cultural level. That means the process of boundary dissolution forms the breeding ground for the restriction of choices. Second, rationalization on an organizational level. Rationalization processes allow amateur aid projects to develop into perfectly run enterprises that operate according to the principle of increased efficiency. Thirdly, symbolization at a symbolic level. At a symbolic level against the backdrop drop of increasing competition over highly functional attributes within companies, moral consumption leads to added value and th thus creates a moral market. And then commodification on the economic level. Poverty becomes a fictitious commodity as it passes through a number of transformation processes. This then leads to a stable relationship between supply and demand that has been established just for this commodity, poverty relief. Now, let me demonstrate these principles more detailed now. And this may explain why Tafeln must meanwhile be seen as moral enterprises, as I call them. Where can we see shifting baselines in cultures of austerity? In a culture of austerity, uh, food banks serve as social substitutes. 
they simulate social inclusion. I will argue that this is not social inclusion at all when people are together uh, at food banks but not part of the mainstream society. Part of shifting baseline is also the deformation of citizen rights into citizens' responsibilities step by step. And shifting baseline also means we all get accustomed to a new frame of reference, a new framework, without even noticing it because it's under the level of consciousness. For example, the institutionalization of precarious circumstances of life and food banks as an answer, as an institutionalized reaction to these precarious circumstances of life. But even worse is the shifting perception of poverty, as I've mentioned before. Tafeln scandalize poverty, but at the same time they uh, contribute to the shifting perception of poverty. They come along with new definitions and habits of normality and the toleration of limits that wouldn't have been tolerated before. The question of tolerable consumption limits is very crucial at food banks. As early as three years after the introduction of the first food bank in Germany, Falk Roscher, one of the first academic observers of Tafel, indicated that private charity was a threat to legal entitlement, saying that when such a system establishes itself, the limits of basic needs dramatically erode. The poor are then represented as people who can be provided for with goods that are of subpar quality on the market. Written in 1996 at the beginning and then nothing. So now we have become accustomed to this system. We have been accustomed to the erosion of limits. This is what shifting baseline means. We also notice a phenomenon I call the double boundary dissolution as illustrated in this photo. For one person, the typical food bank volunteer, here seen on the left hand side, um, food bank, working at a food bank represents a structured life program full with, uh, uh, with self-fulfillment, with motivation, with social recognition and so on. For example, when my mother works at a food bank every Saturday, she feels this, uh, she gets this um, self-fulfillment and recognition and so on. And for the other part, the typical food bank clients seen on the left hand side of this picture, frequenting a food bank represents a basic survival program. And one program is situated completely opposite to the other. It's very difficult to communicate across this table. At this point of my analysis I recommend listening to the voice of food bank users. The following quote illustrates shifting baselines in the form of a survival program perfectly. It's from an email. I regularly get emails from food bank clients uh, and they're telling me their experiences and so on. But it's worth reading it. The food banks cannot substitute necessary social services. Often food bank users realize that the food supply is not of consistent, decent quality. The required minimum subs subsistence level is hardly guaranteed in Germany. Sometimes information on food banks is even contradictory. This is partly due to the fact that negative aspects, which are in fact in a reality, are not mentioned in public. Thus, occasionally, food bank users' freedom of speech is eff effectively forbidden under penalty of exclusion or even legal consequences. In the long run, shifting baselines, food banks will not be able to substitute a crumbling welfare state. I think this is a very nice quote from the perspective of uh, someone who, who knows what he talks about. The second step. Um, from poverty to profit requires rationalization. Firstly, from the perspective of food bank users, this means a certain form of situational economy at the food banks, uh, which is explained in this chart. Based on 150 qualitative interviews with food bank users for this research project, 
which I um, conducted between uh, 2011 and 14, the food bank's social environment can be characteri characterized by a free zone model. Uh, at least I try to. Each zone represents a typical uh, form of social integration of the food bank users into, um, into this environment. We find three prototypical patterns of food bank use in Germany. According to individual and local experiences and personal audits, people come in here, um, they drift into free zones. Uh, this means there is the question or the answer or to the question is the result of my personal uh, experience, accounting and so on positive or negative over a certain period of time. And this means uh, um, is the use of food bank already a routine in my life, of my weekly life and so on, or is it an episodic ex exception? So people come into the food bank, um, into, the, into the zone of negotiation, as I've called it, make their personal audit, and after a certain period of time, they drift into uh, the other zones. Um, users drifting in the first zone uh, habitually integrate food banks into their everyday life without any cognitive dissonance. Therefore, we call it the stabilization zone, zone of stabilization. Some of our interviewed food bank clients even assume that there is a right for a food bank in Germany. So this is something I regard as really dangerous. Uh, in this case, food banks serve as a functional substitute for civil rights. If they claim they have a right to use food banks, a right to get there every week and so on. Users who regard food banks as a form of pragmatic support are ambivalent. They see benefits as well as dissonances and their view undergoes constant re-evaluation based on new experiences and they stay in this nego negotiation zone. And finally, users who feel disappointed by the forms of social interaction uh, and so on and other issues, quality of food and so on, drift into the uh, boundary dissolution zone or the zone of humiliation and so on and they try to get rid of food banks to leave food banks as soon as possible. People stay here the integrated type probably use food bank for years or more than a decade. Uh, people who drift into this zone the distant type probably use food banks for some weeks or months and then stop using it because they find uh, another way to, um, to go around. Secondly, um, what occurs is an orientation towards principles of the economy by the volunteers on the other side of food banks. In the world of Tafel, we both find examples for endogenous and exogenous processes of rationalization. Food bank um, representatives imitate the economy, meaning that they refer to users as clients and they themselves play the role as salesperson. And against this background, establishing relationships with enterprises and economic settings, all kind of economic settings, have become standard in Germany. The political control of volunteer management within the food bank has reached uh, a peak. The form of engagement has been celebrated, for example, by the European Union or by federal ministries, as you have seen. And it is also institutionalized in the form of uh, a national engagement policy of the Federal Ministry for Family Affairs, Senior Citizen, Women and Youth. It is professionalized in the context of uh, countless volunteer trade fairs, volunteer management, prof professionalization in this field and so on. Another element of rationalization also lies in the fact that behavioral economy has become the leading science of food banks. Behavioral economy tries to motivate individuals to make better decisions through nudging or reward and penalty systems. We find these patterns in many fields like consumer protection, nutrition, health, but it also perfectly matches uh, with the world of food banks. The main argument, however, is that the self-professionalization of food banks is based on an external orientation towards 
an economy of success. This can be demonstrated by some different factors. The Federal um, Association of German Food Bank banks protects the term Tafeln itself from other market competitor competitors and seek to defend its dominant position legally by the way founded by donations. And the donators don't know that the money is used for uh, uh, this purpose. Based on reliable cooperation with companies, uh, some of which have been secured through exclusive contracts, I have some of these contracts, and nobody writes about this in the German media, by the way, uh, interests between the food bank system and the, the companies can perfectly be synchronized. <laughs> this comes along with uh, the logics of, for example, efficiency, growth, market penetration, and so on. Products and services are differentiated, and the search for new target groups is a copy of the strategies of enterprises. Meanwhile, we also find animal banks, culture banks, uh, eyeglass or tafeln, eyeglass tafeln, pharmacy tafeln, and so on. Food banks, as I've mentioned before, offer services to children, senior citizens, students, and we have mobile tafeln in rural areas. So this is the expanding logic of an enterprise. As an enterprise within the economy of poverty, food banks imitate the predominant economic rationality on every level from local uh, situational practice to long-term strategy. An even more significant, uh, an even more signifi significant aspect is the general attitude, or you can call it the mission statement, of food banks. Germany's food banks have become monopolist in the market on the market of helpfulness. Using this economic logic, Tafeln have been driving similar institutions from the market completely. There are other systems which are not called Tafeln, but nobody knows them. They have no chance because Tafeln have the mono mo uh, monopole. Um, all in all, food banks behave like enterprises, uh, following a strict economic logic of growth, market displacement. Tafeln are a brand, in one word. <coughs> and this growth logic is based on a fundamental paradigm shift that has gone almost completely unnoticed in the public. At the beginning of the food bank era in the 1990s, the mission statement of Tafeln was to redistribute uh, edible food which was no longer acceptable for retail. A very simple uh, and clever idea. But meanwhile, food banks follow a completely different logic. The food bank's mission seems to have shifted to an aspiration of replacing what is lacking or substituting the missing. This not only means an expansion of the food supply, but also announces a logic of growth, since, in principle, everything can be declared as lacking or missing, like uh, eyeglasses, like, um, well, everything. This brings us to the symbolization. Uh, Tafeln offer reputation as a form of symbolic capital in moral markets. The Tafel is a brand, on its own and it offers professional public relation like a company. They are very successful in transforming poverty relief into a form of symbolic capital, which then can be transformed into economic capital again. As a brand, Tafeln resonate with other brands. They are permanently synchronized with the moral clients. Companies, this is my main argument, are the clients of Tafel, not the Tafel users or clients. In order to demonstrate how brands resonate with the Tafel as a brand, just take a look uh, on the official website of the Federal Association of Tafel in Germany. There we will find the who is who uh, of Germany's economic economy visualized. A brand resonates, the Tafel brand resonates with all these brands. Uh, and they come from all areas uh, of, uh, uh, of enterprise. Uh, lo logistics, uh, uh, telecommunication, and so on. 
So, food banks are close to perfect in terms of symbolization. Through their membership, magazine feedback, again, they offer companies um, a platform for professional public relations. In the anniversary edition of this magazine, feedback, um, the 20th anniversary of food banks in Germany in 2013 was celebrated by presenting all brand names associated with the Tafel. And um, those brands published customized promotional messages, as you can see here. For example, the German supermarket chain Rewe's slogan was, we grow daily and our responsibility along with us. Um, or the company Metro Group headlined with Think Globally, Act Locally, Inspired Shopping. The supermarket chain Lidl, um, and at the supermarket chain Lidl, one can do great things with one small gesture. Mercedes-Benz claims every social movement needs an engine. Lidl, by the way, the supermarket chain, introduced um, a bottle redemption machine where you can give back your bottles and then you get some money back. And you can either take this money here or you can donate it for the tafel. Um, it's a, I call it charity to go. It's a perfect win-win situation. But you also should keep in mind that little uh, this company was under suspect to, uh, to monitor uh, the, um, the employees. And so there was critique. Uh, at Lidl as a supermarket chain and as a reaction they introduced the system and then probably they had from one day to another very positive uh, public relation and a very positive uh, public image. So this is an uh, example for a very perfect synchronization of the interests of the Tafel and the interests of certain companies. Another example, Coca-Cola, even uh, reference to the food bank slogan which is uh, in German in Germany, putting food where it belongs, Essen wohin es gehört, uh, and Coca-Cola transformed it uh, into the trademark, in the, into the phrase "because a drink belongs to your meal." Very clever. The partnership with Coca-Cola is, in particular, is an example for constant synchronization within the economy of poverty. While, according to Coca-Cola, food banks are fulfilling an important social, uh, societal task, the group. Uh, is also flattered to be an official food bank partner. This is very convenient for Coca-Cola's image and entails the expansion of the company's target group downwards since Coca-Cola is for everyone. Finally, this brings us to commodification, the last uh, step uh, in the chain from poverty to profit. My claim is that food banks transform perishable food in combination with poverty relief into a fictitious commodity. And I here re hereby refer to the term fictitious commodity as Karl Polanyi introduced it. Fictitious commodities are not produced for sale, but they can be organized in extremely artificial and irrational markets. Food banks offer and represent moral accountability for moral clients, all those brands that support the Tafel. And the result of this process is the fact that food banks help to increase acceptance, public acceptance, for symbolic poverty relief instead of political and structural reforms. They simulate an activity where we only can find passive behavior when we look closer. So this is a step from um, the process of poverty relief to a fictitious commodity. Let me uh, summarize some of these findings and then I will offer you an, an alternative outlook, something which probably is or should be very, very unknown and new for you. First, food banks can help bridge an economic gap uh, and they can provide a short-term relief for people, of course. However, they cannot offer social and cultural participation as, at least as it is established in Germany's uh, constitution. Tafel demonstrated that the human right to food and the concept of human dignity and self-determined consumption are missing in Germany. Nevertheless, politicians' statements give the impression that the use of food bank uh, does not have questionable connotations. 
and I'm fighting against this for 10 years. For example, the green politician Katrin Göring Eckert in Germany has even referred to food banks as small lift utopias. The commodities food bank users, I would say, I would argue, receive, uh, the commodities food bank users receive do not compensate adequately for their negative emotional experiences. Tafeln are at the most tolerable but not desirable. Food banks do not address the structural roots of poverty. Food banks offers, offer symbolic relief instead of fighting poverty in a socially sustainable manner. And the most important argument, moral markets are based on austerity in combination with the stealth revolution, as Wendy Brown calls this, of neoliberalism. Poverty has an instrumental function in this market. So there's a it's functional poverty. As moral enterprises, um, food banks offer symbolic reputational capital for their moral clients. And in this process, after nearly 25 years, uh, the whole process has become self-referential. And it will stay self-referential. That means um, food banks want to be needed in Germany, in one sentence. They want to be needed. And the effect is uh, what I tried to explain. Now, we can discuss this later, but I want to show you two things. First, this is um, the next step in my public sociology. I uh, sent 100 copies of um, this book, which I published in 2013, so it's uh, a little bit older, to 100 Tafel in Germany, with the idea of getting a response. I sent them a letter as well, asking three questions, like, what do you think, what will you do after 2018, when Tafeln do exist for 25 years in Germany? Because this book was published when Tafeln exists for 20 years. And everybody always claims, we want to uh, stop with the Tafeln and so on, but they never step, they want to be needed. So I asked them, what is your perspective for the uh, period after 2018. And I hope I get some response. And I will, of course, use this response for um, the next book about Tafeln, which is a form of uh, narrative sociology, because I will write a fic fic fictional autobiography of the Tafeln. The Tafeln telling their biography. Uh, in terms of I did this and I did that and so on. And I will see the reaction. So this is also for me public sociology. My narrative approach merges with uh, the food bank research. The alternative outlook. I told you I stopped um, researching actively in the field of uh, food bank research uh, since 2013. And one reason, I just have to mention it, is that um, there are uh, threats against my person coming from the German Food Bank Association and from sing single Tafeln all over the country. I got lo loads of hate mails, letters, and some of them is even asking for my death. So this is not a comfortable situation for, uh, for a scientist. And um, after 2013, I really wanted to, 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 to stop, f at least for a while. However, during a uh, uh, guest professorship at the University of Salzburg, 2015 and 16, in Austria, I discovered a project uh, which reminded me extremely to food banks. Uh, and yeah, my curiosity again started. And currently, I'm writing a book about this um, project as well, within the framework of public sociology. And this project is called Fair Share. Uh, fair share, uh, and I would like to present you uh, briefly this unique project uh, and discuss it uh, in contrast to food banks and Tafeln. Um, and my intention with this alternative outlook is to make visible some crosslinks between food banks and fair share in order to generalize probably, hopefully, some of my findings. Fair share uh, is a container in the middle of Salzburg, uh, in front of uh, a wonderful uh, 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 residence. And fair share is Max Luger. Max Luger is a senior citizen, a former monk, a lay theologian, 
uh, someone who's sitting in this container daily, several hours, and he redistributes money instead of food. Money some people have donated to him before, uh, face to face or uh, uh, in other ways. Um, this project runs since um, 2014 and one day he wrote a mail to me if I'm interested in somehow supervising this, this project as a social scientist because he has read my book Shamland and so on. And I thought about it and the first reaction was I, I can't. I can't because uh, it, it's very interesting but I can't be neutral. Uh, but I made some interviews and uh, ethnographic work and so on and um, uh, spent a lot of time with this, this Max Luger and so on and he explained me his idea, his utopia for me probably or for others. It's a dystopia. I don't know. So. Um, Fair share, meanwhile, since 2014, is well known in Salzburg, in this town in Austria. Everybody knows it. The major knows it. Um, all the people um, in need know knows it, uh, know, know it, and so on. All the social organizations in town know fair share. And I just, I could talk hours about this. I just want to s show you the last mail, one of the last mails of Max Luger to me. And I think this is... Uh, perfect in order to, to see the cross-links between this project and the tafel. Dear Mr. Selke, here are a few examples to show you how important my fair share container has become in the city. A hard-working man was recently taken advantage of by a dubious company and went to the unemployment office where he asked them how he is now supposed to survive and he said go to the container. A woman on minimum benefits isn't able to make an appointment with the social welfare office. When she asked how she should live, they answered, go to the container. A single mother went to the youth welfare office because the father of her child once again failed to pay. She asked how she is supposed to get by and then they answered, go to the container. Now you see, Mr. Selke, that the container is so important. I'd like to hear what you have to say about all of this. Thank you, Max Luger. So this is the end of my talk. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm very curious about your questions whatsoever. Thank you very much.